the first recorded act of God Almighty after man fell into sin in the Garden of Eden was to call to man and ask him, where are you, Adam? Now, you don't think that God wasn't sure where Adam was, do you? But in his act, he was demonstrating the nature of salvation from that point forward because the Bible defines salvation as answering a call from God. He's calling to us. Jesus says, uh, whoever hears my voice, whoever hears the call and comes to me shall be saved. Believers, of course, are defined or referred to as the ones who are called by God. That's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, faithful is he who called you. You've heard the voice of God calling to you to receive his son. In fact, the whole church is referred to as the ecclesia, the called out ones. The apostles were called by the will of God to serve God. But listen to me carefully. In prayer, God pledges to answer our call. In salvation, we answer God's call. In prayer, God answers our call. And I can prove it to you. It's in Jeremiah chapter 33. Will you come with me to that ancient old prophet who wrote probably in the 5th or 6th century B.C.? Jeremiah chapter 33. And I want to read just the first three verses and talk to you about the subject of the call that God answers. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 1, 2, and 3. And verse 3 is my text for today. And as always, let me remind you that the reading of God's word is more important than anything you think about it or I have to say about it. Our best efforts at teaching God's word are imperfect because we are imperfect, but the text does not lie. This is God's word. Watch this. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard. He was in prison. Let me just remind you that restricted circumstances can be the best soil in which prayer is learned. The best opportunities for prayer are often learned in life's stress, most stressful moments. Watch this now. Thus says the Lord who made the earth... The Lord who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Here's our text. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Now it's interesting in verses 4 to the end of the chapter, God actually tells Jeremiah some of those great and hidden things. They refer particularly to a prophecy about the future of Israel. In which he says, even though Israel now has been ransacked by the Babylonians, it will be ransacked by the Babylonians, God is going to restore them as a nation, and he's going to show his glory in Israel and through Israel once again. But that's not the focus of my message this morning. I simply want to park on those few words in verse 3 to show you the power that God himself has pledged to those people who will take him up on his offer to be men and women of prayer. I want you to see, first of all, that prayer is a direct... Are you listening to me, church family? I'm so fired up my heart could pop. Listen, it might just jump out of my chest this morning. Prayer is a pers personal and direct call to God himself. Look what the verse says. Call to me. Prayer is not offering up some incantation of mag a magical formula. Prayer is an invitation to conversation with God Almighty himself. He says, call to me. You, you can't get beyond that first word, call. It's filled with metaphors as it applies to prayer. Let me remind you how, the, how that word call is used in the Old Testament. It's the word naming. It refers to God naming various aspects of his creation in Genesis chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. It refers to Adam naming the animals with God's authority in Genesis chapter 2. It even refers to Adam naming his wife with God's authority. So it has a personal attachment to it. He called Eve her name because God had revealed uh, what he had done. The word means to call out in a loud voice. It's used several times in the Psalms when David said, I cried out to the Lord. 
Uh, I'm not sure why people whisper in prayer so nobody around them can hear what they're saying. Because the Bible talks about prayer as calling on God, shouting to God, because you're impassioned. Uh, the word is used to speak of Moses when he was called by God out of the burning bush. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes because the ground on which you stand is holy ground. I'm sending you to liberate my people. God didn't whisper from the bush. He shouted, Moses, Moses, that's the word. This word is used in that famous messianic prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40, uh, speaking of the coming servant of the Lord who would cry to the people of Israel, prepare the way of the Lord. Do you think he whispered it? Psst, psst, prepare the way of the Lord. No, he didn't. He shouted in the faces of the people of God, calling them to prepare for Jesus who had come. The word is used for summoning Pharaoh called Abram or Abraham when he discovered that he had deceived him. Do you think that Pharaoh was fired up? Uh, his family was now sick because he was, he was flirting with Adam, uh, excuse me, Abraham's wife. And Abraham deceived the king, the Pharaoh. When he found out, he was spitting mad. And he said, Abraham, get your butt in this room. I think that's what he did. The word is to call to Abraham. Moses, uh, Moses called the people when God gave him the law. He called to them, he summoned them. He stood on the mountainside and shouted to the whole nation and said, you gotta hear this. God has written his law on stone and I want you to hear it. That's, that's how the word was used. God calls various people to serve him in diverse ways. He called Samuel to prophesy, and he called Bezalel to lead the making of the tabernacle. Do you see how important this word is? God could have chosen any word to explain the privilege we have in prayer, and yet he uses one of the most colorful words in all of the Old Testament. So what does it mean to call on God? It, not, oh man, listen to me. God wrote it, I didn't. I'm simply telling you what he has said to you about prayer. It means to summons with authority. That takes guts called faith. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God is saying, you call to me with authority, and if you act in faith, I will answer you. That's a pretty cool promise from God. He's waiting to hear your voice. And he himself says, I will stop what I'm doing and I will listen to you and I will answer you. I think that's pretty amazing. I had lunch this past week with the church planter and I said to him, what are you trusting God for? What big answers to prayer are you waiting on God to answer? When I told him what I thought he should be doing, he said, now that's going to take faith, isn't it? I said, that's the point. That's the point. I'd say that in your life. It's not our authority that I'm talking about. It's the authority that God himself has pledged for us in the ministry of prayer. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 says we can come boldly into his presence, not arrogantly, but with confidence, because God has given us the authority to call on him, to summons him to do his work. It's the gift that he has given to us. That's why Jesus told us in the Lord's, as we call it, the Lord's Prayer, we should pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our authority is God's authority committed to us in Christ. When was the last time uh, you felt faith rising in your heart and you called to God as though you were summoning him with the authority that he himself has pledged? Most of you are afraid to operate with that kind of courage in God's presence. But I'm telling you, it's biblical. There's a big difference between the arrogance of man and a proud woman coming into the presence of God thinking she has any right to tell the Almighty what she needs and a person who knows that they are there by God's appointment. God says, Call to me, summons me. And when you summons me, I will show up. And I will answer you when you call out in faith. It's a call to action. This word, call to me, is, 
It means to call or summons with authority. It's to call God to action. It's to hold God's feet to the fire and say to him confidently, you need to intervene, God. You need to stop this madness. You need to deliver your people. You need, you need to circumvent the work of evil. That's, that's the idea in the word. It's to call to action. Do you remember the story of uh, Moses' uh, brother and sister, um, Aaron and Miriam? Uh, they argued against Moses and said, who do you think you are? God can just as much speak through us. And, and uh, Miriam was struck with leprosy. And Moses prayed a short, simple prayer in Numbers chapter 12 and verse number 13. Please, God, heal her. Please, God, heal her. That was a call for God to act. Because Moses knew that he could not heal her. It would have to be God forgiving her and healing her. And God did after seven days. That's the idea of calling out to God. I said to you the word means to call with a loud voice. So it means that prayer must be exercised with urgency and passion. The reason God doesn't bother to answer most of our prayers is because we're quite indifferent about whether or not he answers. Why should he answer your indifferent prayers? Would you do that for each other? Would you waste something so valuable on someone that's just going to toss it away? No, you shouldn't. You have wisdom, don't do it. Uh, the Bible says the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'll never forget as a young Christian, early one morning walking by the library in the small Bible college campus where I was a student, and I stopped dead in my tracks because I heard someone calling out to God in the library. It was one of my fellow students. He was moaning before God. He was weeping for, before God. He was calling out before God. It was the first and most important time I ever heard anyone with a broken heart seeking God with such unrestrained passion that it overwhelmed my heart. Some of you don't remember the name of Harry Ironside, uh, but he was a renowned preacher from Toronto that literally touched the world in his preaching ministry and his written ministry. If you ever get a chance to buy some of his commentaries, it'll be some of the best investment for your library. But Harry Ironside was staying in the home of one of my mentors, Mark Breeden, and early in the morning, Mr. Breeden himself would get up for prayer at 4.30 in the morning, and while he was in his study, he heard a noise that he recognized as a familiar sound of a, a man of God in his bedroom on his knees in the wee hours of the morning calling out to God in prayer. It's why those men accomplish so much more than we'll ever accomplish. Because they knew this, they believed this promise. God says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and hidden things that you do not know. So will you please forget about how you sound to others in prayer? Stop worrying about whether you sound sophisticated. When you're more concerned about sounding sophisticated in prayer, that's why God won't hear you. Stop trying to sound sophisticated and just talk to God from your heart. He can take it all and he wants it all. He wants you to pour it all out before him. Learn to do that. Empty your soul at the feet of the Almighty and find that your heart is wonderfully and miraculously healed because God says, call to me and I will answer you. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do not know of a greater gift in all of the universe than God to say, I'm calling from heaven for you to trust my son that your sins can be forgiven. And then when I become a Christian, he says, now I want you to know I've reversed the roles. You call to me and I will answer you. I'm listening. I, I memorized that Psalm 34 as a young Christian. And I'll never forget stopping on the verse that says, his eye is on the righteous and his ear is open to their cry. So it means to call or summons with authority, to call to action, to call with urgency, to engage in active service. Call to the Lord and he will answer you. What are you doing? You're asking him to act on behalf of his work. That's why in Colossians chapter 4 and verses 2 to 4, Paul asked the church at Colossae, pray for me that a door will be open for the preaching of the gospel. 
So here's a man who's calling God, he's calling on God with authority to see the ministry of the gospel successful in his, in his day. So it's right, isn't it? Are you, are you getting my gist? Are you getting the word this morning? God says, call to me. Prayer is a personal, direct interaction between you and God Almighty. Is there anything wrong with having a prayer book where you read or recite learned prayers? No, unless they're nothing more than an attempt at a magical incantation. I have, my wife and I have several prayer books that we really enjoy. We love following along in the thoughts of what other people have prayed. But if I'm just reading words from a, a prayer book that are not being addressed from my heart to God, they're useless. They're meaningless. So empty ritual prayer does not reach to God. It's a conversation between you. Isn't that amazing? Start to think about it. You talk and God listens according to this text. But I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Let me show you. That's my second point. Prayer is a direct and personal answer from God himself. What does he say? I'll answer you. I will answer you. You don't have to beg, cajole, or shout at me to make me answer. I'm listening. I'm ready to answer you. That's why James said, you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask for selfish reasons to consume it upon your own lust. And that's why I have to say, no, you don't have what you're supposed to have because when you do ask, you ask selfishly. Maybe you should pray, Lord, do you want me to have that job? If you're unemployed, say to him, is that the job you want me to have? So if it's the job you want me to have, I'm calling out to you for the job you want me to have. I've watched people pray for a job God gives them, and then within a month they're complaining about it. That doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, man, I'm going to get myself in hot water now. I was deeply in love with the blonde hair, blue-eyed American girl, and I wanted to marry her. You, you can call us naive if you want, but God has kept his hand upon us and our marriage because of it. We were prepared to say no if at any point we sensed in our heart we were not supposed to go in this direction in the will of God. I had been called, as a, I thought, as a pastor, April as potentially a missionary to children in a foreign country. And I didn't want to interfere with God's work. If God was calling her to serve him in a different area, I, I would, maybe I was young and naive. I don't know. But we were prepared not to step into that love relationship until the word of God and the spirit of God confirmed with us it was the will of God. And we called out to God. We sat together as a young couple and said, thy will be done, not ours. Now, I meant it. I meant it. Do you live that way? There have been times I've stood at the bedside of dying saints, and I've wanted to pray that God would heal them, and I just feel a quiet, uh, indescribable sense. It's not what I'm supposed to be praying. I'm supposed to be praying for grace upon grace, because they're going home. I don't know that God talks. I tell people, you, you live by faith, you don't know when you're going to die. More than likely, God will not tell you when you're going to die. He doesn't act that way. He asks you to trust him through the valley of the shadow of death. But there are times when I have prayed so earnestly, and I meant it with all my heart, and I called out to God, and I thought he was going to heal them, and he didn't. He said, no. But he always answers. He always, God is not indifferent to your cry to him. He's hearing every word. He's feeling every emotion. He's analyzing every motive. He's weighing every word. Because he has made a pledge. When you talk to me, I'm going to answer you. The problem is, God, God's talking, but you're not listening. He's listening to you, but you're not listening to him. That prayer doesn't work unless God is listening. And then you listen and say, speak, Lord. You tell me what you want in this situation. It's a thrilling way to live your Christian life. Not to have to live in fear of making a mistake. 
You're still human, but it's, it's thrilling to live in such a way that I can make my decisions based upon the will of God as I know it today. I have people all the time that judge my decisions. You know why it doesn't bother me in the, in the least? Because I'm concerned that if it is the will of God, I don't care. I don't care what you think. Nor should you care what I think. If you've sought the Lord in prayer and he's confirmed it by his spirit, that doesn't mean I'm not accountable for my decisions. I can't tell you how many times in our marriage we've sat together, I thought one thing, April thought another. You know what that was? That was God saying, take more time to talk about it. Take more time to think about it. And I'll tell you, as a man, 99% of the time, <clears throat> she's right. <laughs> Turn to your husband and say, did you hear what Derek said? Wait. <laughs> Charles Spurgeon said, prevailing prayer is victorious over the God of mercy. When you open the window on your side, it will not be bolted on the other. God will answer you. It's interesting, as I was preparing for this study today, and uh, I was reading a little bit about the first, cent first, second, third century attitude toward prayer, and uh, even from the earliest days, Christians were arguing about whether or not they were simply praying to achieve the foreordained will of God? <laughs> or is prayer actually asking God for a need in your life and receiving from him, not knowing whether he has foreordained it or not? There's been a debate from the beginning, and I would say that the answer runs right down the middle. There's much that we pray about that God has already foreordained, and we're simply not trying to overcome the mind and will of God, but get ourselves in the will of God, get our hearts in tune with the will of God. It's great to pray that way. Lord, I'm not here to get what I want. I'm here to find out what you want, and you tell me what you want. Have you ever argued with God about what he wants? He's made it so clear to me what he wants because my circumstances aren't changing. And I have to say, okay, now the battle really is I don't like what God has assigned to me in my life. So the struggle becomes personal with me. And then I start saying, now, Father, you know me. You made me. I have a strong mind. I have a stubborn will. I have a big mouth. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't surrender easily. But I want to surrender. So you teach me. You show me. You help me. He delights to do that. He's a father who says to his children, I love it when you're honest with me. Because when you're honest with me, it means you're honest with yourself. And you can't help yourself unless you're honest with yourself. So be honest with yourself. I don't like. I don't like some of the answers God gives me. But I'm determined. I'm, I'm smart enough to know. He's always right. I've lived long enough to know he's always right. So I would say that prayer is both nurturing my own heart to accept the will of God. And he is the sovereign God. He knows best and he can weigh everything together and determine the outcome. I know that and I believe it. We're not trying to force God's will because accepting God's will, not changing his mind, is as much a part of prayer as anything else. We're submitting our desires to him, not in the hope of changing God's mind, but in order to cooperate with him in what he has already determined will happen. But if that's all that I taught you about prayer, I think I would be lying. I think the Bible makes prayer about asking and receiving. Because Jesus said even in, in his model prayer, ask God for your daily bread. Doesn't it make sense that if God is concerned about meeting your need for daily bread and you are to pray about your daily bread, then you can talk to him about other issues, other matters in your life. Your finances, your job, your education, your friendships, your, your vacations, your business, your life, and on and on and on and on we could go. I think that the Bible gives plenty of evidence that prayer is receiving from God the needs that we have in our life. Matthew 21 and verse 21, Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what is done to this fig tree, but you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. That's pretty amazing, don't you think? You need to see your boss saved by the grace of God. 
You have a Muslim friend that is angry toward the gospel in Christ. You have a marriage that is falling apart. You have wayward children. Call to God and he will answer you. You tell him what you believe is right and what would honor him, and he says, I will answer you. That's just one verse, by the way. I could keep going. Uh, Not the least of which is several texts that we have already read and will study in the book of 1 John chapter 5. How many of you are still tracking with me? I'm so thankful for this promise. God says, I'm listening to your call and I will answer you. And thirdly and lastly, watch this now. Prayer is a direct and personal tutoring from God or by God himself. Prayer is simply calling out to God and receiving the answer back from him. And as we commune with God our Father, he says, I'm going to tutor you with a spiritual mind. I'm going to open your understanding to spiritual realities that you could not know otherwise. So prayer is one of the key disciplines of the spiritual life. If you are not growing in grace and deepening in your understanding of the truth of God's word, it probably comes back to a misdirected prayer life. Some of the best lessons that God will ever teach you is when you are in prayer. God loves to interrupt your prayer life. When you're talking to him, he loves to show you things that you have been asking him long ago. I have it happen all the time. I'm in in a prayer with the staff, and I'll have thoughts about the sermon, and while they're praying, I'll get out a note and write it down because I think, that's what I've been waiting for. I've been asking God to show me what that text means. God speaks to our hearts in prayer. Why is this important? Watch this now. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the natural man cannot receive the things that are from God. He cannot discern them. In fact, they are foolishness to him. But the, the wisdom of God can only be discerned by the help of the Holy Spirit. So the human mind is closed to the truth of God until the Holy Spirit opens it. And when will he open it? According to this text, he'll open it in prayer. He'll give you a glimpse into truth that you have never known before. Having told you that I believe that prayer is asking and receiving from God, I want to show you as I finish up in just a moment what it is not. Prayer is not a blank check for you to get all your wishes and dreams so that you can bask in wealth and prosperity. That is a damnable doctrine from the devil himself that is making a mockery of the gospel. Does God care that I have enough money to pay my bills? He sure does. There are times April and I have lived by faith where we didn't have food in our cupboards. We prayed and food would appear on our front steps. There are times when we could not give our children Christmases and we would pray and come home and there were gifts on the front steps. God does care even about the little things in life and I bless him for that, that he has loved me enough to give me the little things in life. But I'm telling you, prayer is not a blank check for you to get a Mercedes. That's baloney. This past week, I received a letter from a local pastor. And here's what it says. In part, by the way, just so you know, he sent the uh, direct deposit notification along with the letter. This is what prayer is not. On March 13, 2015, the Lord spoke to me. He told me to communicate with you and write this letter to request financial assistance. According to the budget we, that is he and the Lord, came up with, I told the Lord we needed $10 million to cover a period of four years, so that's why I'm writing to you today. Um, I don't mean any disrespect to this local pastor, but I think that's a shame on the gospel. I think it's an embarrassment to all of us as pastors, and I don't think God communicates that kind in that way. I don't even know what he's going to give to this church. It's none of my business, but I I pray about it. Lord, you know the needs meet the needs, and he does. Uh, That's not what this text is talking about. What is he talking about? He's talking about giving our minds a dose of spiritual reality that changes everything. He's simply saying that when you call out to me, I will answer you, and your mind will start to understand the truth that God has written in his word that will change your life. Can I just take a moment, thank you, you're going to give me just a moment, to talk about some of the things that I think he'll show you that are magnificent things, they're mysterious things that are written in his word. He'll give you 
oh boy, forgive me for this word. He'll give you a mental picture, a vision, if you will, that you can see with the eye of faith in understanding who he is. I think he'll give you a vision of you and he walking together in the garden. You know I say that? Because it's true. There was a time when man and woman walked in uninterrupted fellowship and friendship with God Almighty. God walked in the cool of the garden. There was no interruption of sin. And God wants you to see that, that great and hidden thing, so that he arouses in your heart a desire to experience that kind of intimacy and friendship with God. How cool is that? That you would have a vision of being lifted out of the chaos and of your sin and restored back to a relationship with the Almighty God. Along with that, I think, the greatest vision that God could ever show you is the passionate love that he has over your life. I'm surprised how few people know this verse and fewer still that have experienced its truth. Not only did man walk with God in the garden, but God apparently sang over them. He wrote a love song. He watched Adam and Eve in the garden. He wrote a love song. And he, when he sees them, when he sees us, he breaks out in a song. You say, you're stretching it. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I ask people all the time, can you hear it? And they say, hear what? I say, hear the music of the heavenly band. Max is going to play in that heavenly band. Gabriel's going to get booted off the piano stool and Max is going to play. <laughs> if I have anything to do with it. Do you, do you ever hear the music? No, what you hear are the dark words of self-recrimination and condemnation of the enemy. You need to hear the beautiful music that God is making over you. That's biblical. Do you see it? That's what I'm talking about, seeing. I would also say, if you're going to have a biblical vision from God and learn the hidden things of his word, you need to see the wretchedness of your own soul. You need to see that you are so thoroughly stained by sin that there's not a single shred of hope for you on your own. That's why the learned apostle Paul at the end of Romans chapter 7 wrote, Oh, wretched, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from this body of death? You need to see the pain of your own wretchedness and sinfulness. You need to feel the weight of your sin and the guilt of your waywardness before God. And maybe you need to see as John did in Revelation chapter 20. John said, I saw a great white throne. And him who sat upon it from whose face earth and heaven fled. Then I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And they were judged out of the books. Revelation chapter, right? At some point, in order to have the vision that God wants to give to you in understanding his truth, you have to see your own stubbornness and sinfulness and wickedness. But please don't magnify it beyond what God himself has. God tells us the truth about us so he can redeem us from it and give us a new view of who we are. You should pray regularly. God, help me to see myself as you see me, not as I see me or as I feel about myself. That's a very biblical prayer. Help me to see myself as you have described me, not as I feel I am or as I see myself. How does God see you? He's written a love song about you. Can you hear the music? That's one of the things I think you should see. I'm wrapping up. He says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and hidden things which you do not know. John the Baptist was still alive when he had the great privilege. Remember this, no, excuse me. Not just, yes, it was John the Baptist. I think it was John the Baptist. I'm drawing a blank on which John it was. Oh well, a preacher's mistake. In John chapter 1, Jesus Christ appeared within the view of John and he cried out, 
Look, look. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The single greatest truth that God can ever show you in your mind is the truth of the cross and of the precious Son of God who died there and spilled his blood that you could be redeemed. That's the single most life-altering scene, truth that God can ever write in your mind. One last one and I'm finished. When I was a young Christian, I remember hearing a preacher preaching on Ephesians chapter 1. Verse number 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he stood in the pulpit that day and said, Do you know what that means? God has lifted you from the grave of your sin, and he's exalted you to the very highest heaven. And with Christ you are seated in a place of spiritual authority and love and acceptance. Can you imagine what that meant to a boy from a broken home? From a life that had already been devastated at 16 years of age? I've been included in the Almighty's family plan. I'm part of the God of Heaven's very own household of faith. That's a vision that will change you forever. And where do you get those visions? In prayer. In prayer. That's why you should pray about everything. That's why Paul said, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. You need to be a praying man. You need to be a praying woman, because God Almighty has an appointment with you, and he wants to hear your voice, and he will answer you. It may take him years, but he will answer you, and in the process, you'll look back and say, it was not the answers to prayer that were so amazing. It was the lessons I learned in his presence as I prayed. Lord Jesus, I remember that day when you were in the temple and you braided a whip and you booted the people out, turned over the tables of the money changers because they'd made your temple a place of commerce, a market place to do earthly business. And you said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Make this house, a, this church house, a house of prayer, O oh God. Show your people what is at stake and what will be lost if we don't pray. Show them the untold blessings, the untold victories, the untold lives that will be changed if they pray. Show it to them, Lord. Show them, open their ears to hear the beautiful song that you sing in celebration over your people so that they will be enticed into that conversation, that sacred conversation between you as our God and us as your children. Make this church a church that prays, not for the sake of building a reputation, but for the sake of not neglecting the unspeakable privilege of relationship with you. In Jesus' name.